。千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. In this depiction, we see two people. And at the top of the slide, you get their names, Huinan and Shen Xiu. And I realize that this uh, Shang Xiu is uh, probably hard to pronounce, but actually it's easy to pronounce in the in Mandarin, Shen Xiu. It's just that it's not phonetically uh, depicted in a, in a way that's easy for a native English speaker. So with these two, who are they? Now, you can see that there's writing on the wall there. Huinan has what looks like the poem, and Shen Xiu does as well. Huinan to the left, Shen Xiu to the right. So Huinan looks like he's wearing this uh, normal, everyday clothing for ancient China. Wow, Shen Shou is in the Buddhist robes. So I should tell you about these two before we get into the poetry between the two of them. So Shen Shou is a monk, as you see here, and Hui Nen, as the story begins, was a commoner. So he's a young man as depicted here and he was always a very intuitive thinker he knew nothing initially about zen buddhism but then one day while running errands he heard the diamond sutra being recited and it connected with him it had a powerful effect on him he right away in that moment knew that he wanted to study Zen Buddhism, that he needed to do everything he could to learn Zen Buddhism. So he decided to travel to seek out the leader of Zen Buddhism at the time. Now, this story occurs more than a century after the time of Bodhidharma Bodhidharma became, became the first patriarch of the Zen Buddhism tradition. He passed it down to the second patriarch, and then the third, and the fourth, the fifth. So by the time that Hui Nen, the young man, traveled in search of Zen Buddhism, he was seeking the fifth patriarch. So in other words, by his time, Zen Buddhism had already been in China for five successive generations of spiritual leaders. So when he got to there, it's a monastery, it's a, a Zen Buddhism temple with many students, many disciples learning from the fifth patriarch. The leader of all the disciples was Shen Xiu. So that is why he's in Buddhist robes. Hui Nen was just a commoner. He was just a lay person seeking wisdom and knowledge and teaching from the fifth patriarch. So he was accepted by the fifth patriarch as part of the, the disciples, and he was given menial tasks to do, to perform at the temple. At the temple, everyone was expected to work. They work and they study, and that's, that's how life went on in that remote monastery or Zen Buddhism. So then one day, the fifth patriarch contemplated the next generation. He knew that he was getting old, he should be retiring soon, he should be passing on the mantle to the next patriarch, who will be the sixth. Now, who should it be? Well, the logical choice 
seems to be this person on the right, Shen Xiu. Shen Xiu was excellent in every way. He studied diligently. He was a great leader to all the disciples. Everyone liked him and respected him. Everyone thought that for sure, Shen Xiu would become the sixth patriarch. But the fifth patriarch knew that the key for him to pass on Zen Buddhism was not to the popular choice necessarily. Sometimes it may be to the popular choice, but the passing down, the passing on of the torch for Zen Buddhism was not a popularity contest. He needed to pass it on to someone who really got it, who really understood Zen Buddhism. Well, how do you tell that? You can't read someone's mind. You know, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't even, you can't even, you know, ask them like multiple choice questions and say, which one is the correct answer? So what he, uh, the, the way that he chose to figure it out, to figure out who had the understanding was that he wanted, he thought, he thought about this and then he, he made this, this announcement. He said to all the disciples, uh, it's time for me to pass on, you know, the duties of the patriarch to the six. And I need to select from someone who really understands our tradition, our teachings, and the great truths of Zen Buddhism. So I want everyone, he addressed all the disciples, I want everyone to write a poem to describe, to express your understanding. And if I see someone who really, who really gets it, I will pass down the ropes of the Bodhidharma and the begging bowl of the Bodhidharma to that person. The Buddhist robes and the begging bowl of the Bodhidharma passed down, you know, for uh, by that time more than a century is the is the symbol of power in, in Zen Buddhism. It's only the patriarch who is qualified to take them uh, as part of uh, part of his uh, position. So, so this was an interesting challenge. And this is, uh, in modern times, this would, this would boggle the mind because it is like you have this religious tradition and you're trying to find the next leader for that. And the way that you find it is to get everyone to write poetry, right? It, it boggles the mind. But this is, uh, this is the way that he chose. Most of the disciples, they automatically forfeited. They automatically decided to give up. They all said, well, I mean, of course it's going to go to Senshio. Why should we even bother? So they didn't come up with their own poetry at all. They were all looking to Senshio. Now, Senshio was truly excellent as a Zen monk, and he was also very humble. So he thought, well, uh, okay, well, everybody's expecting me to do something. Should I do something? Well, but if I write something, that means that I'm trying to go after this position. That's really ill befitting the teachings that I've been studying. I shouldn't do that. But then on the other hand, I have this command for my master to do it. So I really have to. And plus, this will be a way for me to, to learn from my master, the fifth patriarch, how much I really know. He can tell by reading my poetry where I'm at. He can provide me with feedback that will, you know, allow me to grow further. So, okay, I should do it. So he wrote this poem, and the poem that he wrote is, as you see on the right-hand side of the wall there. And when the other disciples saw this, they all said, wow, what a great poem. They all decided to commit it to memory. So every day, as they went about their tasks, they were all reciting this, you know, making it like a chant. So Hui Nen heard this as well. Now remember, Hui Nen is a powerful, intuitive thinker with a direct understanding of the Zen teachings. When he heard it, 
he immediately understood where Shen Shou was at. And he immediately figured out that there was a level above what Shen Shou understood, that Shen Shou at that level was not yet ready to touch. So he decided in the middle of the night to express his understanding in his own poem, which you now see on the left side of the slide. Now, of course, I realize that as you're looking at this, uh, these poems mean nothing. So, so I want to uh, translate that for you. And I want to show that to you in the next slide. Dueling poems, Sen Xiu and Hui Nen. So here's what Sen Xiu wrote. This is the same thing that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, I am writing it, writing, writing it out, uh, left to right, up to down, uh, instead of the, it's all the same characters, but just uh, wrote out differently in, in a different sequence. So what, what does it say? What does it mean? Here's the translation. This is, by the way, this is uh, my own translation because the uh, translations used by scholars uh, and academics, I find to be uh, not very satisfactory, so I had to come up with my own. This, I can guarantee, is the absolute closest that one can come to in the English language. Body is the Bodhi tree. Mind is like clear mirror stand. Strive to clean it constantly. Do not let the dust motes land. What does it mean? The Bodhi tree, also known as the tree of wisdom, that is the tree that the original Buddha sat under in meditation when he attained enlightenment. So here, Sen Shou is comparing the human body the physical body to the Bodhi tree. And therefore, he's also by extension comparing the Buddha nature that everyone has to the Buddha that is sitting next to the Bodhi tree in meditative pose. So that right away, that line establishes that Sen Shou had a great understanding of Buddhism. Mind is like clear mirror stand so he's comparing the human mind uh, and also heart uh, to the, the stand upon which a clear mirror is uh, installed. So this is often mistranslated as the mind is like clear mirror or bright mirror. These are all poor quality translations. Let me explain. If you say that the mind is clear mirror stand, then the mirror itself would be the soul, a distinction between the spirit and the thinking process. So once again, the original depicts Sen Shou as a monk at a very high level of understanding and able to express that in just a few characters. Then he says, strive to clean it constantly, clean the mirror. Do not let the dust motes land because everyone knows if you have this mirror that you have sitting around, if you don't do anything to it, it's gonna gather more and more dust. It's gonna get dusty. You have to wipe it clean and you have to do this all the time. There's always dust coming to land on the mirror. So this is a metaphor. It's a rallying cry to the disciples of the fifth patriarch that everyone should be practicing uh, Buddhism, the Buddhist teachings, constantly. That's what he means by cleaning it constantly, is to clean the soul, so to speak. Do not let the dust motes gather and obscure the brightness, the clarity of the soul. So that's his level. 
That's his understanding. Now, before we go further, I want to point out to everyone that the translation has the word strive in it. So if you recall from my previous talks, in the Tao, there is no strife. So the moment you say strive to clean constantly, the moment you realize that this is actually not exactly at the level of the Tao. So that is the same realization from Hui Nen when he heard this, when he heard the other disciples reciting it. He asked to be uh, led to where the poem was written on the wall. So when he saw that, he asked for help to write his own poem. So here's what he wrote. These two poems have been set to music. They are one of the most well-known uh, poetry in Chinese culture. So what was the response for Hui Nen? Here's the absolutely most accurate translation possible. I'm <laughs> very comfortable in claiming this because I've spent literally years to uh, polish this up. Hui Nen wrote, Bodhi really has no tree, nor is clear mirror the stand. Nothing's there initially. So where can the dust modes land? That was the response. So let me break it down for you. What Hui Nen is saying is that all of these things that we're so concerned about, these are manifestations of the physical world, the material world. If we can see through the illusory manifestations, we would realize the true reality, the reality of the intangible, of the Tao, of the spirit, of the soul. It's emptiness. So it's empty and intentions are part of that emptiness. The soul, the spirit are all part of it. Those are the real things. Material objects, not so much. Therefore, clear mirror is not the stand. The soul and this physical stand are actually quite different. There is actually nothing. So where can the dust motes land? If you are, so in other words, if you are attached, if you are very set in thinking that there's something rather than emptiness. So for instance, if you think of your own reputation, your own ego, your self-respect as things that can be wounded when someone insults you, boy, it's time for war. You wage all out war to avenge yourself when someone says something that you take as an offense. But if you recognize that there's actually nothing, it's actually all just material world squabbling, illusory manifestations, then you can be free of the ego and the dust modes have nowhere to land. That is the realm of Wu Wei, the realm of detachments, and the realm of the Tao. So now let's draw a connection. Let's make the correspondence, let's uh, showcase the correspondence between Zen Buddhism and the Tao. In Zen Buddhism, at the level where Sensho is at, strive to clean constantly describes the discipline. It's the discipline that can eventually lead you to the ultimate attainment. Ultimate attainment meaning the great awakening, the enlightenment. But the discipline is not the attainment. 
the vessel that takes you to the distant shore, the opposite shore, that vessel is not the destination. It's the means of getting there. I think everyone follows that, right? Now, the Tao says, low virtue takes contrived action and acts with agenda. So remember, low virtue can be fake, but it can also be discipline. It can also be something that you do in order to rise to the level of high virtue. So either way, it's contrived action and acts with agenda. Agenda by itself can be a positive or negative thing. You may have a hidden selfish agenda. That could be negative. Or your agenda could be to better yourself. That could be positive. All right, so that's one aspect of it. What so what Sten Show was describing maps directly to the state of low virtue, but in a positive way, in the disciplined way. What about high virtue? Nothing there initially is the realization, a spiritual awakening that the world is illusory and the emptiness of the Tao is the true reality. Wow. Lao Tzu says it this way. High virtue takes no contrived action and acts without agenda. And that is because high virtue is a state where you have realized that there's no need to battle one another in the material world. There's no need to try to showcase yourself as the best of the best. You no longer have the agenda to do that. All of those are part of the squabbling that we do in the material world. You free yourself from it and that allows you to practice high virtue. So there's plenty more, there's a lot more details in the story about Huinan. And I want to make a reference here that if you are interested in the full story, you can easily find it at www.daoism.net. In your browser, you can simply type Taoism.net and it will take you there. When Once you are there, you'll see right in the middle of the menu, Platform Sutra. Clicking on that takes you to 10 chapters in the Platform Sutra. There is actually a lot more of the Platform Sutra. I'm going to have to work on the rest, but from 1 to 10 actually completes the origin story of Huinan, how he heard about Zen Buddhism, how he went to the Fifth Patriarch to study, how he encountered this test from the Master, the Fifth Patriarch, and how he prevailed by demonstrating a higher level of wisdom, and then received the begging bowl and the robe, which, by the way, no longer exists. That is because one of the story, part of the story in, in, the, in this Zen Buddhism tradition is that there was such squabbling and contention over the begging bowl and the robe, the, the robes of the um, Bodhidharma, that the sixth patriarch, Quinan, came to the realization that these symbols of authority have become the bone of contention to fight after. Therefore, from that point on, from the point of, from the time of Sixth Patriarch onward, no longer the passing down of the bowl and the robes. Those are, after all, the manifestations of the material world. So it would be fun and interesting if the begging bowl and the robes are still uh, on, a, on display in a, uh, at a museum someplace as a historical relic, or maybe as holy items in the current practice, in today's practice of Zen Buddhism. But no, that is not the case. Everybody who learns from Zen Buddhism should understand that this is something to free yourself from. 
to detach from. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.